We will either reclaim a meaningful, accountable Christian discipleship, uh, we'll reclaim a church with authority, or, or this movement too will die, and God will raise up something else to do the function that God needs done. Welcome back to the Firebrand Podcast. I am Maggie Ulmer, and I'm here today with Scott Kisker, Bishop Emeritus, Mike Lowry, and David Watson. Hi, Maggie. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hello, gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us, Bishop Emeritus. I am delighted. Oh, and um, why don't you tell everyone what you were doing in the lovely city of Dayton this week? So uh, it is my great joy and pleasure uh, to be in Dayton as the Bishop Emeritus in residence here at United mm. for what we call our Demon Intensive. And we have, um, I don't even remember what the number is, 200 plus, something like that. Something uh, like that. Doctor yeah. of Ministry students here. That's awesome. And uh, it is a week of uh, tremendous learning, great preaching, uh, genuine spiritual growth, and uh, intellectual ferment that I find stimulating and thoroughly uh, delightful. I have the privilege of working with Dr. Justice Hunter and Dean David Watson uh, on the Living the Historic Faith cohort, mm. uh, which is part of what I've been doing today. And, and that in itself uh, is something I find uh, desperately needed by the church today, the kind of insights that that, that teaching from the historic Christian tradition brings to the table of a modern Christian movement in great ferment and under great pressure. Amen. Well, can I can I ask you sort of a an incidental question here? Um, what was your favorite thing that happened today while you were among students in all of this intellectual ferment? Um, one of our DMN students, uh, uh, the Reverend Leslie Tomlinson, I. Mm -hmm. I think soon to be Dr. Tomlinson, um, uh, did a devotional presentation this morning that, that I thought was superb. Nice. Thoughtful, um, engaging, that was followed by a plenary speaker who also gave an engaging presentation. I took notes on both of them. Both dealt with the cost of discipleship, mm. which has been sort of the theme of this week. That's a that's an issue I think the Christian movement at its best in America is starting to seriously rethink. And I, th I believe we desperately have to, have to wrestle anew with issues of uh, formation and catechesis and, and in, in the crudest terms, what in the world it means to actually be a Christian. Amen to that. That yeah. is all true that's a very good question i'm i'm going out to lubbock to give a a presentation um this weekend and uh, the great city of lubbock texas <laughs> where i spent four years at texas tech university and you remember and two and a half of them <laughs> <laughs> and um so you enjoy the mountains of lubbock yeah, yeah the okay. mountains of lubbock they're they're wonderful yeah and, but if you do drive a little bit outside the city, you can get to some beautiful canyon area. You can. So, yeah, Caprock Canyon and Paladuro Canyon near Been Amarillo. There. Yep. And, yeah, really pretty area. But um, one of the things I'm talking about is how do we, how do we think like Christians, right, which mm -hmm. is something that I talk about ad nauseum. How do we think like Christians? Because if we can't think like Christians, then we can't really act like Christians. And the question, what does it mean to be a Christian in today's context, is bound up with the issue of how we, of forming certain habits of mind, how we approach the world, and the actions that kind of flow out of that as a result. Hmm. One of the things we do in our Doctor of Ministry group is we read a lot of primary texts. And so we read, for example, and worked through the Apostolic Fathers. You know, we worked through recently, Hippolytus. We worked through Hippolytus, um, the Apostolic Tradition. And, and I think these kinds of things are important, and I think they're, they're formative, and I think clergy really need to immerse themselves in these, these texts of the early church. And 
Christians have faced a lot of different types of circumstances over the years, yeah. <laughs> over the thousands 2000 of years. Yeah. years uh, yeah. Not to mention the 3,000 before that. Of, yeah. Uh, uh-huh. Attempted faithful living to <laughs> Yahweh. What but, do you, what do you think, what's, is there anything about this particular moment in time that strikes you just as a historian? I mean, fortunately in, in our context in America, we're not being, it, we're not facing violence, physical harm, but is there anything in particular that strikes you about what we face as Christians? Um, I, I just, I mean, for me, the, the current chaos, what feels to me like, you know, lack of order. I was reading a um, uh, Wall Street Journal op-ed piece, I think, where uh, the person was talking about the change that happened in America, I think it was 1973, when we first started having uh, checkpoints at airports. Like prior, I mean, prior to that, you just walked in, you didn't need a ticket, you walked up, you bought your ticket, you went to the gate, your family met you at the gate. There was no, no checkpoint. But then in the seventies, there were some hijackings and suddenly we, what, what he, what he obviously is, we stopped trusting the person next to us. Mm. Mm. And now we've got like military grade, you know, (laughs) it's easier to get into the Dayton jail <laughs> to visit someone <laughs> than it is to get to a gate at the airport, right? So, you know, we've suddenly stopped. There's a la- there's a breakdown of trust in our neighbor. And s- simultaneous to that, I think there's just a genuine breakdown of... Um, of just agreed upon norms for behavior, mm-hmm. right? I don't trust my neighbor because I don't trust that they share some sort of agreed upon normative good behavior with which to guide our corporate life. So you've you've got a breakdown of a sort of corporate intelligence, really. You don't even have agreed upon notion concepts of truth. Mm-hmm. Or, or good even, and evil. Yeah. Or, right? or whether so, there is such a thing as truth. Or whether there is such a thing as good, good and, evil, and evil, right? right, right. So, you know, so then you end up with coercion as the other option. Well, we've certainly seen, um, we've seen this play out in a lot of different contexts. And do you, Bishop Emeritus, I, 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 I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how this particular dynamic or if this particular dynamic has affected our landscape of the Methodist tribe, the United Methodist Church. Do you, like, have we had a loss of common language? Do we trust each other? Are we dealing with these things? Well, so, so let me give a, a general answer and then invite you or <laughs> uh, either Scott or David to, to probe further. Um, I've heard this age described as an age of religious anarchy, and I think mm. that's right. The, the church has been here before, though. This yeah. is not new turf for us. Uh, in fact, I, I, as one, am convinced and have been saying for probably 20 years now that we're closer to the book of the Acts of the Apostles than oh. we've been since the Battle of Mulvan Bridge. Well, I, I agree you know, with that hardly. You know, since <clears throat> Constantine was, was uh, dancing around. And... Um, uh, and I and I think in that sense we we can take some hope here. Mm-hmm. Um, the Lord still reigns, mm-hmm. and w- we need to be um, patient and modest in our own understandings, while at the same time fully and seriously engaging our cultural situation. The the second thing that I think I'd want to say um, uh, pretty clearly is that that the time of great ferment in the wider Christian movement, which certainly includes the Methodist tribe, mm-hmm. which is more than the United Methodist Church. For the, for the record, I am no longer a United Methodist. Mm-hmm. I, am a, I, I am a global Methodist. I'm a retired global Methodist bishop. That's mm-hmm. where the title emeritus comes in. In global Methodist church, that simply means a retired bishop. Um, so, uh, so within the wider Christian tribe, including the Methodist branch of that, I think we're in this time of ferment that actually is, is desperately needed and truly healthy mm-hmm. for us. Um, 
Now, having said all that, let me tell you, it's painful. It's personally painful. It, as someone who spent 30 years as a local pastor before I became a bishop, it's painful uh, in local churches and in pastorates. Um, uh, we're wrestling with something that I think at a minimum is going to take us 50 to 100 years to sort through. Wow, yeah, yeah. I, I believe that. I do think we've, we've lost a common language. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I didn't no. No. answer those questions. We, no, we, absolutely. We, we, use, we use the same words, but we mean different things. And the loss of that common language has in part resulted in loss of common beliefs and practices. And so, you know, I, I think that the, I've been trying to think, I put my finger on like, what is, if you could nail down one thing that has caused all the separations in mainline Protestantism that have been going on for since well, 30 the, years now yeah, at least. 30 yeah. years yeah um, what are they and I'm starting to think that the issue really has to do with sources of authority and epistemology mm. okay what do you mean by epistemology so epistemology how you know what you know the mm -hmm. branch of philosophy that deals with knowledge and i'll read you a quotation from gary dorian who is um, a great scholar of liberalism uh, if you want to learn about the liberal protestant tradition there's no one better to read than this guy and he says the idea of a liberal approach to Christianity is at root a simple one, and I believe a necessary one. It, in essence, it is the idea of a theology based on reason and experience, not external authority, which offers a third way between orthodox authority, relig orthodox authority religion and secular disbelief. There are many varieties of liberal theology, but these two factors define the category, the authority principle and the principle of integrative mediation. Liberal theology conceives the meaning of Christianity in the light of modern knowledge and ethical values. It is reformist in spirit and substance. It is deeply shaped by modern science, humanism, and historical criticism. Mm. It is committed to making Christianity credible and socially relevant. In liberal theology, the Bible remains an authority for faith, but its authority operates within Christian experience, not as an outside force that establishes or compels belief. And so given that definition, I was, I was really struck by the idea that, that um, he thinks of conservative religion as authority religion, but he thinks liberal theology is not authority religion. That's interesting. Well, it's certainly interesting to consider that in light of how it is practiced. Right. Yeah, so I, so I, would, I think I'd want to argue. I mean, I think that's an accurate reading of what he considers. I think I'd also want to, want to challenge it because I think that very notion itself is nonsense. <laughs> and and, um, and let me, let me put a first stake in the ground, not a last one, but a first stake in the ground by simply pointing out that the one place freedom of uh, expression uh, and academic freedom is most challenged today is actually in the liberal academy. Mm. And, and in fairness, it's not really the liberal academy, it's a progressive academy, mm. which is, which is which different. Which is illiberal. From, yeah, which is illiberal at its, at its heart. So uh, uh, th th there's a famous quote attributed to Peter Drucker that goes, culture eats breakfast Culture eats strategy, strategy for, for breakfast, breakfast every yeah. day of the week, mm -hmm. and and I think that's true. And I think what what is happening is that the is that the chaos of a modern culture um, is is just engulfing our understanding of truth, our understanding of what is morally right and wrong, and hence our understanding of good and evil, mm -hmm. and often standing that stuff uh, right on its head. For my own uh, strong conviction is that it's time for the Christ, for the Christian faith to wake up yeah. and, and to gain some courage and to graciously with, uh, as my 
friend and colleague David Watson says, with epistemological humility, uh, stand for the truth. And so, and so I'd want to plan it. So, you know, Maggie, it's a, it's, this is a personal bug of mine, but it drives me nuts when people say something like, my truth. Oh, yeah. Really? Truth is truth. And if it isn't, then it isn't. You're such but a it's, monotheist. But, <laughs> yeah, but it's it, but the notion that this is something like, well, I got my truth and you got your truth, that, that is just literally nonsense. It makes no sense. Mm. Anyhow, no. lights my fire, you know. Understand, understandably. I, I you know, I, I'm... I'm reflecting on some of this and, and wondering if there is some parallels between, you know, the, the late 16th century and um, early 17th century is a, and ours in such that you have a breakdown of authority and some of it, quite frankly, is caused by corruption of those authorities. Those authorities we have... Yeah, and let's own it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, and... You know what we ha we have what was known as the, the the colloquy of Regensburg, which was the last attempt to try and reconcile Lutheran Reformed and Roman Catholic positions, and ultimately they they agreed on things like they could come up with they could ham out an agreement on the doctrine of justification by grace through faith, but what they couldn't by that point agree on is you know. Uh, how is Jesus present in the Eucharist? What is the authority of who? What is the authority of bishops? Mm. You know, and of tradition. Uh, these are the things they couldn't agree on. And when they send it back to the various parties, what really collapses the whole thing because they wanted to at least establish agreement on the things they could agree on, right? Which was like the nature of sin and all of these. They got all these doctrinal agreements, but by the time this happens, and it's fifteen. It's before the Council of Trent, so I've, I'd have to look it up. But, you know, I want to say 1550-something um, before Luther dies. Uh, anyway, the, the trust had been lost. Basically, the Pope was like, you all need to butt out. We'll call a council. Uh, <laughs> Luther's like, you know, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm glad for the concessions made, but I don't trust the other side. Hmm. Right? So by that point, there's there's... You know, the the ability to reconcile the church and a um, a, a medieval late scholastic worldview is now impossible. And part of that's thanks to the coming of Renaissance ideas and uh, you know all that that came with that. Anyway, the the. The attempt then, therefore, after this to kind of shore up authority with state churches um, seems to me one of the key reasons for liberalism because as, the, as the, the same kinds of intellectual ferment that caused the breakdown of the late medieval causes the breakdown of modernity uh, and, you know, the need to open the tent wider and wider with liberalism uh, is an attempt to hold together this kind of notion of a state church or a big tent church, mm. which mainline denominationalism is, you know, all the mainline denominations are in some way connected to European state churches. Anyway, it, it, it seems to me that the, the danger is, of course, when all of that breaks down is the fear is that violence will happen. And maybe that, you know, it, it, it kind of sucked to be an Anabaptist in, uh, in the 17th century. Well, what was it, the thing that you said, the Protestants were killing the Catholics, the Catholics were killing the Protestants, and everybody was killing the Anabaptists. Yeah, because they don't fight back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the Catholics were killing Catholics, too. Like, the French decided they were on the side of Protestants for the Thirty Years' War. But mm. in any case, uh, the, the, you know, we think about we can be somewhat um, maybe rose-colored in our view of, you know, pre-Constantinianism, but th there was a lot of violence against Christians. Yeah. And in the aftermath of the breakdown of the church's uh, coherent vision in the West after the Reformation, there's a lot of violence. 
And I'm not sure the uh, the state churches would have held on as long as they did if there hadn't been a revival, mm -hmm. a, a cross-confessional revival that meant that there was something beyond our intellect to hold Christians together and accountable in terms of how they perceive what it means to live out the faith. So but, one, one way of taking that a next step, I mean, I... I think your rendition is both fascinating and, it is, to the best of my knowledge, quite accurate. But one way of, fasc of looking at that with some fascination for our age is um, that, that we, I'm going to speak specifically to the Methodist tribe, not just the United Methodist mm -hmm. or the Global Methodist, but the wider Methodist tribe. Among the wider Methodist tribe, not only is there no common understanding of language as David pointed out earlier, but there also is very little trust, and there even is extremely low trust within the branches of the tribe. Oh, yeah. So that one of the things that the UMC, the United Methodist Church, and the Global Methodist Church are both wrestling with is, gee, what does it look like to actually have trust in these groups? Mm -hmm. and, we're, and we're trying, but... But boy, that that's at the moment that's really difficult and in very short supply, mm -hmm. and that kind of chaos um, ultimately um, will be resolved one way or the other. Hopefully, prayerfully, without violence, you know. But at the same time, one way or another, it has to get to some kind of settled point. And I, I, I think. I think you guys are on to something. I, I'm not sure I have specific answer. I've got hunches uh, for it, but that we've got to return to some issue of what does it mean to say something's the authority? Mm. At the moment, this really is an age of religious anarchy where every, you know, <laughs> reminds me of judges. Everybody's yeah. a law in their own sight. Yes. And how'd that work out for you guys? Well, you know, if you read your Old Testament, the answer is not well. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I would... One way, place where I would give, in light of this discussion about the breakdown of authority, one place where I would challenge um, Dorian's <coughs> analysis is when he says that liberal theology is based on reason and experience, not external authority. Mm. But I think, I mean, at some point I would, I would love to hear him respond to this. But I, by that he means revelation, right? Re well... What I, what I push back on is say is you are under external authorities always, whether you acknowledge it or not, right? Yeah. Your, whole, your whole view of the world is shaped by certain um, authoritative understandings of what reality is like. And liberalism is not simply the autonomous, unaffected person who um, goes about reasoning in an unaffected way um, and utilizing his or, or her experience, experience and... as an autonomous unit, entirely autonomous unit. I mean, we are deeply affected by the world in which we live in ways in which we don't even see. Yeah. And w liberalism, liberal mm -hmm. theology, is deeply Western, and it is deeply modern, and it is affected by the sort of construction of reality that is given to us by modernity and by Western culture, often in ways that I think are uncritical. And what, one of the things that, you know, the, a worry I hear from people a lot about the Global Methodist Church is that it's going to be the United Methodist Church 2.0. Hmm. And I think it will be that unless we conceive of the task of the church um, appropriately in light of our present cultural moment. And that involves reckoning with the idea that we have lost a common language, not just in the church, but in Western culture individually. I mean, uh, Western culture um, gl more globally than that, and um, or more broadly, I should say. And so part of the task of the church is going to have to be bringing people into a community of a kind of a very thick formation, very deep formation in this community, and then teaching them to speak 
a new language and thus to think about reality in a new way. And if we can't do that, then I don't think that the project is going to succeed. And so by saying, <clears throat> excuse me, by saying teach them a new language, do you mean the language of the church? Well, the language of the church. The language of the faith. Yeah, the language of the faith to 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 have them immerse themselves in scripture, to have them immerse themselves in the creedal tradition mm -hmm. and begin to learn what we mean by words like God. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you ask the average person on the street, what do you mean by the word God? You will probably get lots of different answers. But for a Christian, the answer is first and foremost, it is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we kind of have to spell out what those things mean as well. What do we mean by salvation, right? Yeah. What do we mean by the word good? Yeah. And what do we mean by the word evil? I, I mean, these are just very basic things. And from there, we develop a new way of thinking about life, a specifically Christian one. It's not that we're all going to so, agree on everything, but there are certain basic first principles that we have to have in hand. So a way of thinking about this is is that the is that the second struggle to mm -hmm. take place in the global Methodist Church. The first struggle is just the struggle of separation. Yeah. And the second struggle is going to be one that's going to struggle over the the core theological heart of the church and what does it mean in effect to be Christian. It's a reclaiming of the role of what we commonly call catechesis. Sure. Uh, uh, and and in what in modern language we tend to call formation, mm -hmm. and the reclaiming of that, and that's gonna that's gonna have de be deeply doctrinal, and we're gonna live or die on our ability uh, to jettison nominal Christianity, and and kind of vague big tent thinking, for the historic faith. My own my own deep conviction. Is is that no other route will even work? Mm. I think, I, though, too. I mean, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to ask you a question, actually. Oh. I, I think, though, too, we also need to, um, you know, for the GMC needs to reinstitute the uh, parameters of trust that broke down. Yes, I would agree. And. Part of that is saying this is how we believe we discern the will of the Holy Spirit for mm -hmm. the church. Mm. And we need to it, – it, and this is just what we call discipline, right? And it's what we traditionally yep. call conferencing or councils or whatever. And, um, and we will hold ourselves to what the community discerns the Holy Spirit, you know, is directing us for the next four years or however much it is. And I, I just, uh, it, without that, you know, I, I, there's uh, uh, many, you know, communities I can go to where I can find, you know, good, uh, yeah, especially in the splinter groups, um, <laughs> doctrinal teaching. You know, Roberta and I went to a Presbyterian church for our anniversary down in Louisville this past uh, week. Uh, or a week ago or so, um, and you know they were, it was solid, solid. I'm not even a Presbyterian, right? I don't, I, you know, I'm not Reformed really in almost any way, but I was like, okay, yeah, this is, you know, I I would be glad to have my children, and the place was packed with teenagers and kids, right? Yep. I would be glad to have my children, you know, get this doctrinal agreement. But in terms of the denomination being able to hold itself together. I do think there has to be, you know, what when trust breaks down, there's no, you know, pointing to, yeah, but we believe all of these things uh, on on paper for our doctrine isn't going to isn't going to help us. So what we're talking about then is returning to some form of accountable discipleship that is systemic that that applies to bishops yes as well as as well as and, uh, and applies to our general members, our, our, general our general council, council. Yeah. yeah right and and we have a saying that is not even remotely 
uh, indigenous to us in the Transitional Leadership Council of the Global Methodist Church, that we're uh, building the plane while we fly it, or more preferably, we're building the bridge while we walk on it. One of the things uh, I think we're discovering is this is a lot harder than we thought. And I think it's going to, it is currently ragged. My own bias is that there are some things we can point to that we've really got wrong and we need to correct. And and I don't, I don't mind naming some of them. One is we need to hold that general conference soon, not later. That mm-hmm. that would be a personal bias of mine. I, I, I understand that the pressure to to hold it back is a pressure that has to do with trying to let the rest of the world come on board and not. But just what are they it. coming on board to? Well, I, 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 <laughs> you know, there's no I, there's I, no I, there I, there without a general yeah, conference. I, I under, if you're a Methodist, I, yeah, you know. I understand, Scott. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> I'm trying to be gracious. Yes, you I, are. I see. There, you know, there, uh, there, yeah, are, yeah. there are two sides mm-hmm. to yes. that argument. That's right. I, I've been pretty clear about where I come out in terms of an earlier one. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the other is to say this is not we are not going to solve this quickly. I think yeah. I think the other real issue is that we we got to I think we're going to reclaim we're going to reclaim trust as we build genuinely accountable discipleship. So 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 let me push back and I, I want to carefully do this with uh, in a wider context than just the United Methodist Church. In general what we loosely call the main line in Protestant American Christianity, in general, it lacks meaningful, accountable discipleship. And that one of the critical steps is to reinstitute that. One of the other critical steps, I think, is a reclaiming of what I like to call, you can use different terms, core Christian doctrine. Mm -hmm. So a genuine reclaiming. It's amazing to me how many people who say they're Christian can't name two of the four Gospels. I mean, you know, that... That is a little terrifying. Yeah, I mean, that 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 ought, that ought to sober you uh, pretty clearly. Um, I mean, you know, they're basic stuff we've taken for granted so long it's just not there. And I, I, can't, I will say this over and over again in this podcast and in any form. <laughs> this is going to be a long, slow process. And we're going to have to keep working on it. And we will take uh, three steps forward for every two back. I mean, or two back for every three steps forward, to put it differently. I mean, I think that's the reality. Now, that, I do not mean by that that that's an excuse. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think right now we've got, we've got to get some of the ecclesiology right quickly. And we need to do that. Um, we need to do that. <laughs> trying to think of the right words here. We need to do that uh, uh, with more um, speed than we are now doing. We need to have it have it nailed down quicker. And we need to do it, frankly, more audaciously mm. than we are now doing it. We tend to be too timid. Right. I like to say there are a lot of churches that are, that are in between UMC and GMC, and, and they're what I call the mythical middle. They, they somehow think that this exists out there. The answer is no, it doesn't. We will, we will either reclaim a meaningful, accountable Christian discipleship, uh, we'll reclaim a church with authority, or, or this movement too will die, and God will raise up something else to do the function that God needs done. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I have a, two questions but I know that they're going to lead to other things. So, But I, I'm curious, Scott, what you think the role of the Holy Spirit is in just the... Just So I agree that there needs to be a reclaiming of, of formation and catechesis and all of those things. And as I'm listening to all of you, you know, very experienced and and well-educated gentlemen speak. I'm I'm curious, like in the midst of catechesis, where how does that inform experience, and where is the Holy Spirit in those things? I I mean I understand how it informs experience in the sense of creating frameworks for right belief to take hold and then how right belief can then translate to decision making and things like that. But I'm also just wondering about the enlivening power of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know, do you think that contributes to to like repairing trust and things like that? 
I mean, I, I you know, you, you can't, the, the Holy Spirit's not going to um, move you in while you're in disobedience. Well, probably not. But so that's I partly mean, where uh, an agreed upon a- accountability is important, yeah. right? Um, but also, you know, I, I, my pietist, you know, we all know I have these proclivities. Well, I don't think you I will ever you. be, I don't <laughs> think you will ever believe in the Trinity until you have an encounter with Jesus and therefore, and the Holy Spirit, because those two things always happen together, mm-hmm. right? And suddenly you realize, oh my goodness, I have a personal relationship with Jesus who has a personal relationship with the Father, and I have a personal relationship with the Father now too, and a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit, and they're all God, and they're not, you know, I mean, until until you know something experientially, you're never going to make sense of it logically. That's true. Now, to that, to be fair, you somehow have to be introduced mm-hmm. to the possibility of that, right. and that comes through catechesis. Yeah. That, you know, you have to know that Jesus is at the door knocking <laughs> before you open it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I also think, though, that proper catechism gives you um, a truthful framework for understanding your experiences. That's right? true. So let's say that I have an experience. Like, I just feel all the time. Like, you do? I'm, not, I'm not living the right way. <laughs> That's, you're hilarious. I'm sorry. But let's say that I, that I feel all the time. Like, I, I'm just not – something's missing in my life. Something's wrong with my life. I don't think I'm living right. I don't think that that my life is ordered in the way that it should be, but I don't know how it should be ordered. Mm-hmm. And then with catechesis, with, with just teaching the Christian faith, you know, you could say to this person – well, that's because you're not living in the right way, right? You feel guilty because you are guilty. Yeah. And there are some things that you you don't have to live that way and you don't have to feel that way. So we can diagnose this problem for you, but we can also give you some ways of thinking and and speaking and acting that help you to bring your life into agreement with what God wants for you. Mm-hmm. So... so um, I think that's spot on, and I think one of the ways to claim that is when we use the word catechesis and others, we have adopted a learning style over the last, and I I don't even know how long, but it's certainly been the life of my ministry, which is almost at 50 years now. Um, uh, We, we, you know, I, I was taught, immersed in, learned, and actually was a pretty good practitioner of informational teaching Mm -hmm. and we need to get back to a christian faith that is transformational Mm. in its essence uh that's deeply relational that's that's transformational that involves an unapologetic um intertwining of uh both orthodoxy and orthopraxy Mm -hmm. so so that the two simply cannot be separated And so one of the things I think just needs to be dropped in this discussion about how we reclaim the trust, how we get back to the to the teaching is that we have to we have to conceive of the teaching dramatically differently than the system we've been using. Hmm. So I look back on my own ministry with some with some real repentance here. And I was really good at the informational system. I mean, it really was. I used to claim I probably started more new Sunday school classes and Bible studies than than uh, most any pastor going. I don't know if that was true or not, but it it kind of felt that way. I also killed more. I mean, I wasn't the best at doing it. Um, <laughs> it's really painfully true. Uh, but too many of them were informational. They weren't transformational. Hmm. And part of that was it was that I was. I was stumbling along trying to feel my way into a new way of doing it. And I and I think we've we I think we've got to reclaim all of that. Interestingly enough, uh, fascinatingly enough, uh, blessedly enough if that's the right word, we've got that out of the Christian tradition. Amen. Both the model of the early uh, of the early disciples and more specifically in the Wesleyan uh, class and band yeah. meetings, we we've got something that will do it. And I think I think that will reclaim trust in a in a significant way. It just will not be quick. It will not get us there quickly. 
Yeah, I have a, a one of my colleagues at Spirit and Truth who specifically teaches on discipleship when we travel to churches. He likes to say, his name is Tony Miltenberger. I want to give credit where credit is due. He, When he teaches on discipleship, he says, look, what we're going for is intentional, relational, and reproducible. Like a good discipleship is intentional, it's heavily relational, and then it produces more disciples. Like you're equipping someone to yeah. go and be able to make more disciples. And I um, I was like, oh, I like that. <laughs> That's a, it's a pretty good working definition. Friend of the show, Tony Miltenberger. <laughs> right. Friend of the With show. his own podcast, which we could <laughs> promote. promote. Yes, <laughs> the Reclamation Podcast. Yeah. Um, and I, well, go ahead. I mean, I, I, I just want to, I can testify a little bit. I, I do think that this, um, that the class meeting, so mm -hmm. that you having this space where people who are questioning or are hurting or who have, you know, church hurt, hurt or whatever yeah. can come into a community that speaks a particular language about salvation, about God's healing, about, um, you know, who God is, uh, and build relationships there. I mean, that is, for Methodism, was the foundation for catechesis going forward for yeah. forever. And I mean, we're about to, in my tiny little church that I help oversee, um, you know, we're tonight we're breaking off another, you know, uh, class meeting, and we've already, it's already full. Right. I mean, like we need to break it up again. But we haven't even met. It's the, for tonight's the first meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but it just means that, you know, there is a hunger out there for yeah. a yeah. relational community where you can learn this language together to, you know, to start speaking this way in a community because you're not going to learn it out in the world at all. Yeah. That is not the language you're going to he you hear on the radio, on the news. You know, anywhere, any other community we, you're in. We will, and that, that's exactly right. We're going to learn a new language if we're in this. And in learning the new language, we'll learn a new way of relating. And you can flip that. Mm -hmm. We're going to learn a new way of relating. And as we learn a new way of relating, we're going to learn a new language. I mean, the, the, it, that's a, a, it, the two go together. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's almost like asking which comes first, the chicken or the egg. And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> they do. Okay. And, and I think we need to just get, we need to get, just get very, very clear in that. One of the things that intrigues me, and I don't even remotely have an answer, is it's going to change the very size and shape of churches. Mm. My hunch is that it may, okay? Um, uh, but it, but it, 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 it's, uh, we're, we're away from settling that. It will certainly move us at our best uh, if it works, which I think it can, it will move us away from an institutional church that is clergy heavy. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by clergy heavy? Um, well, I invented that term uh, on the spot here. So right now, thirty yeah. seconds ago. <laughs> yeah. Do you mean clergy centered? Yeah, I'm, I mean uh, basically um, what we've had is a kind of professional. Uh, church uh, and, and annual conferences and, mm -hmm. and general conferences run by clergy. Yeah. And so that often when you look at who gets elected delegates, what happens is the clergy go around and say to the laity, vote for Mary Sue or Joe Blow. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so um, we do it. I remember my first general conference it was in the United Methodist Church. It was in 96. And there was a really sweet lay person who got elected because he was a sweet lay person. And sitting near the end next to him was, was one of our leading clergy persons. And I used to kid that clergy person that she actually had two votes. You know, mm -hmm. because he, he'd turn and look at her and she'd say, you know, vote this way. Yeah. You know, and so so we've been a clergy run institution. Now, again, I, I want to be careful here. I don't want to just throw books at the Methodist family, sure. which is my family. Even though I've left the UMC to become GMC, it's still my family. And and there's still great affection on my part. Um, I, I think that's generally true of Protestantism in America. 
be. Um, and at some point here, I want to slip in the other thing that that's a place we need to go learn, which is outside the United States. Mm. We know, we know <laughs> that the center of Christianity within probably 30 years is going to be China. And that today it's probably Africa, Africa. you know, and, um, and, and the rise of the evangelical Protestant movement in South America mm-hmm. is stunning. Not just evangelical, but Pentecostal. Pentecostal yes, Pentecostal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I am, I, as a board member at United, I am proud of is that we are open to a Wesleyan version of Pentecostalism at United that Mm -hmm. I think is remarkable. Now, bear in mind, you're hearing that from somebody who came into the Christian faith as a Quaker and likes to sit in silence and is, you know, that's about as far from my comfort zone as I can get. But I think there's something dramatic to teach us about how it means to reclaim being Christian. Although Mm -hmm. the parallels between the original Quakers and and contemporary Pentecostalism... I'm very aware of that. Yeah. uh, Yeah. You know, they're they're not as they're, they're not as far as I think. I remember the old Quaker thing where a bunch of them were arrested and they didn't have enough guards to take them to prison. So the Quaker said, "Okay, we'll we'll get there," and they walked off in good order and delivered themselves to prison. Right. You know, I mean, it was that kind of. But integrity. Quaker meeting was noted for prophesying. Right. Yeah, and yeah. it was and it wasn't speaking under the spirit. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Not, yeah. Believe uh, me, been there done that got the t-shirt uh it's not quite <laughs> quite where i am today but but there's something to learn here yeah. we we um we in the west and so that's more than that's america and europe we, we tend to think we have a lock on theology in ways oh, sure. that we just have got to be humbled on and i see that happening i mean i think there's some mm-hmm. there's some really good things going there i do think that Charismatic and Pentecostal Christianity are only going to grow in influence Mm -hmm. um, worldwide, but also within the United States. And the reason for that, well, the reasons are different in different places, but I think the reason for it here is going to be that um, it's like Paul said, I came to you with a demonstration of the Spirit and power. Yeah. And people are so bombarded with messages right now and people and, and you know, dings and everything um, vying for their attention. And it's hard to get through with any kind of meaningful message. But when people see a demonstration of the spirit in power, um, that can that can that's going to make an impression on them. Mm-hmm. And I I I think that. I was talking with, I don't even know who I was talking with <laughs> at this point. I don't know. Um, but I was talking with someone, and we were talking. It was on the Plain Truth podcast. It was on the Spirit and Truth podcast. And, you know, we were talking about divine agency. Yeah. And, or talking about the charismatic movement. They said, well, you're an academic and a charismatic. That's unusual. And I said, well, I mean, it's certainly unusual in the main line. But all it means is that you have kind of a strong sense of divine agency. That's all charismatic means is that you think God has agency. Well, and this is where, you know, we talk about Pentecostal and charismatic and, and, you know, those words can be off-putting to people. But it really, I think it just means Christianity. Yeah. I mean, even the strongest (laughs) cessationist, right, by which I mean people who think, oh, the gifts of the Spirit ended Mm -hmm. with apostolic times. Have you ever met someone who who didn't pray for healing? Yeah. Have you ever? I mean, how many how many you know Southern Baptist strict folks will say you know the Lord was led me to, or Lord said to me, right? This is all supernatural, right? Yeah. This is not uh, you know I I opened or you know I opened the scripture and that was it. Well, it's not that. That's opening the scripture even to that page is a supernatural act of God to communicate to you. Yes, the medium was a a text. But, you know, what prompted you to open the Bible at that moment to ask the question? What made the Bible fall there? I mean, all of these things, right? It's sort of of like the atheist who prays every night he'll he'll meet someone who can convince him there's a God. Right. I I mean, all of these, the, the... we, we talk about like charismatic or Pentecostal uh, Christianity 
transforming South America, where now like 50 percent are, quote, Protestant, unquote, whatever that means. And um, all that means, I mean, maybe this is just Christianity, that God is active in the midst of his people. Yeah, and I think I'm, I think I'm quite willing to go there. I mean, as I said, this for me has been has been a steady movement, mm. uh, it, it, one I welcome, but I also want to own it. Takes me it takes me outside my comfort zone, oh, yeah. and I, I tend mean, to think that's okay. I, I want to lift up one other piece yeah. that, that sort of isn't on the table, but I think has to be. Go for it. We have worshipped our buildings. Oh, amen, sir. And and um, what is it? The heart and soul. I think doctrinally uh, is not just uh, is not just the traditional or classic Christian doctrines but but the recovery of some sense of placing ourselves under the lordship of Jesus Christ such that we're subject to his leadership alone mm. so I, I go back all the time it, both in my own devotional life just just me my wife and I talk about it um, in our own devotional life, but I also go back in the life of the church, the earliest Christian affirmation, Jesus is Lord. Yeah. And the concomitant uh, implication to that, and Caesar is not. And that means, and we can do our long list of other things that are not, which would include things like my political preferences, greed, mm -hmm. human sexuality. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we can get a long list of, and that includes, by the way, my building. Mm -hmm. You know, God can show up in places other than uh, the, the building my church may have owned for 80 years. You know? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah you're you're right. not going to get any argument here. Well, I, I know <laughs> yeah. you're not, but, but, but let me nail it. One of the pushes yeah. for the global Methodist church is it seeks to reinvigorate the Wesleyan movement in America mm. is going to be, can, can we get back to a Christianity that is deep enough that is beyond nominal, uh, into the kind of uh, into the kind of deeply relational, deeply uh, e experiential, um, deeply uh, faithful uh, mm -hmm. discipleship accountability that that moves us beyond that kind of institutional tie. Mm. And I think the answer to that is we don't know. Well, we're going to find out. Yeah, we're going to yeah. find out, and that's a that's a fair fair assessment, I would say. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation, and I'm just so grateful that we had the time to have it today. Um, closing thoughts, Dr. Watson. No, uh, thank you, Bishop Lowry, for being on with us. Really always appreciate learning from you, appreciate your wisdom, and also your leadership, which thank has you. taken... Uh, a lot of backbone in this difficult time in the life of Methodism. So thank you for um, what you've done. Thank you. That's been our podcast for today, you guys. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you to Bishop Emeritus Mike Lowry for being our guest. Give us a follow on Twitter at Firebrand Talk. And remember to subscribe and share this podcast.